Today I had Laura Brady, founder and CEO of Concierge Auctions. For six years straight, they have been in the top 500 for Inc. Fastest Growing Companies. Laura's been uh, in the top 100 for Inman for three years straight, top influencer award. They've done two and a half billion in sales in 40 states and 29 countries. I hope you enjoy the podcast and please leave me your comments. All right, Laura Brady, welcome to the podcast. Byron Lazine, thanks for having me. It's been so long and this is, this is gonna be really cool because it's gonna be a good chance for us to catch up. And uh, I love hearing about your company. It's an amazing company, Concierge Auctions. Why don't you start with just the short version of the story? I, a lot of people may not realize you were actually a luxury agent before you started this. So why don't you just share uh, the quick version of how this all started? I was. So our co-founder and I, Chad Roffers, he and I worked together in luxury real estate sales in Florida before starting this company in 2008. So we started to watch the market turn in Southwest Florida as early as 2005 and six, um, as far as inventory rising and sales, you know, starting to either plateau or decline. And so we knew ahead of 08 that there was some sort of pending market downturn that was coming. We didn't know the extent of which it would be in 2008, but we started looking into auction as a way to help our sellers create a more time certain sale and to sell their property ahead of what we saw was coming, you know, in the years um, ahead. So we started working with other auction companies and started looking into the auction atmosphere. And um, ultimately what we found out was that no other auction firm was executing auctions in the way that we saw that they could be done. Um, so fast forward 12 years and we have now sold properties across 40 U.S. states and 29 countries. And uh, what we really you know, had the vision of creating back then was a database of clients that are constantly looking at high-end properties all over the world and being able to, you know, serve them with what they're looking for at the same time as helping sellers accomplish a time certain goal. So that's kind of the, the not so short story, I guess I went on and on, but that, no. that's how we founded the company. And it's interesting now, the atmosphere that we're in, um, that, it, there are some similarities, of course, it's not the same as it was in 2008, 9, and 10, but we have the opportunity to help a lot of sellers in uncertain markets like today. Yeah, and I think people, when they think auction, they think maybe bad times, like you, you, know, you started it in kind of, you know, certainly mm -hmm. bad times, or, you know, people have the connotation fire sale, which is certainly not true with, with what you do, but... What similarities are there right now? I, these are wacky times or uncertain times, right? So you had a 10-year run of really good markets. How does the good market compare to when you started and then the time that we're in right now? Yeah, great questions. So yes, the connotation that some people think of when they think of auction as it relates to real estate is distress or is lower priced properties, right? And many people think of properties that are investor type properties or bank owned properties going through an auction process. So we really have spent years educating the market about our platform being more akin to auctions of fine art or antiquities, you know, how to create a market when there's a very small buyer pool, um, specifically for properties that, you know, are highly amenitized or are one of a kind. How do you create urgency in buyers? Um, to act and also when they do act, how do you instill confidence in the buyers that they're paying a fair price? So for us in When we were founded in 2008 9 and 10 We were definitely helping more clients that had some sort of stress or distress to their situation where they had a need to monetize their properties more effectively um, or on a, on a time frame um, so then fast forward, like you said, for the past 10 years, between 2010 and today, we've had an extremely healthy market. And so our sellers have trended more towards sellers that 
are just making the, the smart decision to sell their property in a matter of 60 days instead of the uncertainty that it could take even in a very healthy market to sell a high-end property when the buyer pool is small. Um, so we're definitely starting to see a shift already over the past two months um, that is going back towards some sellers that have more of a need instead of just a want. Um, and we're gearing up for that of what I think we're, you know, again, gonna be able to work with a lot of agents and sellers who who are hiring us for that very specific cause to whether it's helping them to um, negotiate with a lender involved or you know other kinds of liens that may be on the property there's going to be more of that we we foresee and actually are already seeing in the next year than we've seen in the past 10 years yeah 2008 9 10 11 that was a housing crisis that put us into recession this is much different so what's your thoughts on the luxury price point going forward. And, no, it's, and it's a totally different ball game too. Sometimes it, it doesn't even correlate with what's happening in the economy, the actual sales prices or average sale prices. You know, I think every agent knows what's going on in their specific region or their town, but globally and nationally, what, where do you think sale prices are going for the luxury market? Yeah, we actually just had a webinar that we conducted yesterday about an index that we publish once a year about how the highest end of the market is performing. So we, this is our fourth year to publish the luxury homes index where we analyze the top 10 highest sales in 56 of the top luxury markets in the US. And so, yes, you're right. It's insightful to watch what has been happening with pricing you know, over the past five and 10 years. But today, when we're displaying that information and the findings that we had in 2019, of course, we're having to then have additional discussion and footnotes about how these different markets are going to be affected by what's going on right now. Um, my, what we're seeing is that so far, right now in this environment, there is certainly an uptick in interest from a look perspective online, right? Like our web traffic is through the roof as is most other, um, you know, most other websites as people are consuming information while they're at home. Okay. Our sales have still been going steady um, and, and bidder count has still been very strong. There are definitely still buyers that are interested in purchasing right now. Um, with that said, we have a feeling that there will be a number of months post the, the release, once people start moving around after this shelter in place right now, there will likely be a number of months where we'll see some pent up demand and some prices being similar to what they had been pre-COVID. Um, however, I then feel as if there's going to be an increase in inventory with homes being listed by virtue of how much change is going on in everyone's lifestyle right now. It's going to cause you know, them to want to transact their homes in different ways. And that is then going to likely see you know, either a you know, steady, long, long haul um, with prices remaining steady or, or declining in some markets. Um, yeah. yeah and, and then when you look at consumers transacting differently, do you also see them purchasing different types of properties? Maybe not the Malibu waterfront home. Maybe I've seen you guys auction and sell some beautiful ranches with tons of acreage, right? Where you can maybe self-sustain a little bit more. Do you, do you see buyers needs changing? Yeah, there, there are a number of trends like that that we're watching that it, it, it remains to be seen how, how hard those trends are going to carry on. But things like people valuing space more, valuing privacy more, right? Everybody's been in their homes for so long now, they realize that the benefit of having a very comfortable home. Um, so homes that have very large square footage that have been difficult to sell over the past five years because they've been less in vogue. Um, I think there's going to be a trend towards more people being interested in those again, as well as, like you said, yes, ranches and farms and properties with room to roam or be able to have self-sustaining elements to your home um, or your land. I definitely think there's going to be a trend towards that as well as people learning right now that they can work from 
wherever they want to be in many cases, right? People can be remote like we are right now um, more easily um, than they could have, than they realized that they could have in the past. So perhaps a migration of people to living in areas that they wouldn't have thought before, like moving, why not move to Hawaii or, you know, tell your ride Colorado and actually work from there, um, as opposed to having to live close to your office before. So I think we're going to see some of that. Um, and yeah, then like size or let's see, I was talking to Seth O'Byrne. He's an agent in San Diego and I was, yeah. He's had a great statement about how space is the new value, right? Like people want to have room. So um, it also remains to be seen how much there's going to be this movement from urban areas back more into suburban areas. Urban's been so popular for the past 10 years um, yep. and that migration is probably going to change a little bit. I always, I was always saying, you know, on podcasts or whatever, that technology is going to be what reverses us back into, I, was, I just call it the woods here in Connecticut, like push it back out into the woods. But yeah, and to, into the suburbs or even beyond the suburbs, like when, when technology got to the scale of being able to get places maybe a little bit quicker or to your point, more seamlessly work from home even, then you're going to want that bigger home again where everybody, to your point, yeah, has, has been downsizing and, and going urban. But then you have a situation like this that has almost changed a lot of people's needs overnight, right? It's, it, it happens so quickly. So we're all kind of learning on the fly. But we always go back to, you know, what was in history anyways. And, and I do think people are going to be going backwards into those bigger homes that they vacated in the last five to 10 years because they didn't need them anymore because the family was out or whatever their situation was. Right. I, I agree with you. People that are, walk me through the process, all right? Because I don't, let's backtrack a little bit. Walk me through the process of, I'm a seller and this is the route I want to go. I want to have a sale in, in the next 60 days. Maybe I've tried to sell my home and it was overpriced or whatever the situation was. I didn't get enough attention to actually get offers. So I want to sell it now. I'm going to come to you. What's the process look like? Sure. So first things first, we always work with, a real estate agent on both sides of the transactions that we conduct. So when we get a call from a seller, as you just teed up there, our first question is, is your home listed for sale? And who is your agent that you're working with? Because we want to bring the agent into the discussion as soon as we can. And the agent is a big part of our execution of what we do. Also, we're selling properties all over the world and we are not on the ground necessarily market experts in every every market. Um, I mean, if we've done business there, then certainly we, we know the market well, but we rely very heavily on the agent. So with that said, though, most of the calls that we receive are from homeowners, the sellers calling us directly. Um, most of the time they have been listed for sale and they're frustrated with the fact that they have not sold their home yet. Um, but we're, we are starting to see more and more sellers who have not had their homes listed, especially in this environment, sellers that have been calling us in the past few weeks, they have had again, a need that they um, want to, you know, step up and put their home on the market and they haven't been on the market before. Um, but most of the properties they have been on the market, a seller calls us and we bring their agent in the discussion. We talk about, you know, how long it's been listed, what kind of buyer interest they've had. Um, we, from our perspective, analyze the property and the seller on a number of different, in a number of different areas. We actually have a grading system so that we can determine if we think that we can perform well for that seller and achieve the goals that the seller is hoping to achieve. Um, right now, with that said, we are looking at about 20 properties for every one that we accept because of you know, us not aligning directly with you know, whatever the seller, seller would like or the property not aligning. And yeah. your investment is significant. I know enough about your auctions to be dangerous. There are a lot of times where you're sending somebody to the auction for 30 days from concierge to the location there in a hotel for 30 days. To, so basically the agent that's you know working with the seller, maybe they were working previously or, or brought in by you guys, 
they now have this full team behind them and somebody physically there for like open houses and helping out coordinate with the showing so that the agent is, is still able to, you know, perform the rest of their tasks that they need to in their business. So your investment upfront is significant, which is why you're probably turning down 19 of 20 opportunities. It's not like, like anybody can just uh, go ahead and sign up for an auction with you. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Byron. I mean, for us, we put so much capital and effort into every assignment that we take on that we want to feel confident that we're going to sell it. And also that it's not just going to be an exercise or a waste of time for the seller or the, or the agent. So our typical investment is anywhere from fifty to $150,000 on each property that we take on, um, which is also why we work mostly with properties priced $5 million plus. Um, we do have some sales in the million or two and a half million dollar mark, but most of the properties that we're selling are at the, the highest end of the market in their local market. So every, every market has a different price threshold above which properties are more difficult to monetize. And, you know, I often get asked, what, what do we call luxury? Well, it varies from market to market. Um, but because of that significant investment that we're putting in and we are sending a salesperson to work locally in the market with the agent um, for a period of typically four to six weeks, um, we want to make sure we can do a good job with it. With that said, I'll point out we don't charge an upfront fee to the seller for properties in the Americas. We do have some areas in Europe where we charge an upfront fee because there's added uh, part of our process that we're adding even on top of that, but we don't charge an upfront fee. We are fronting the cost. So, you know, it's almost like a different entrepreneurial pursuit in, in every property that we take on. Same as a listing agent has with every listing, except instead of a year long of, of, you know, a marketing commitment, we're condensing it into four to six weeks. I would imagine you, you can tell me if I'm right, that a lot of sellers before they start to become educated on the process, they have this fear that they're not going to have any control of the sale. What type of control does a seller have once they start the auction process to either pull out, adjust, shift, have say as you move forward? Yeah, we actually say that our process puts the seller in control. So we have to educate the agent and the seller about what we mean by that as opposed to people I coming didn't. I didn't know said. that, by the way. So I didn't, I didn't like tee you up. Yeah, I did not it. know that that was what you said. <laughs> it's great because we do, but, but many people come to the table thinking the opposite, just like you said, right? Um, the seller controls all the terms of the sale except for the ultimate price, okay? Because the price is up to what the buyers bid. Um, with that said, the seller controls whether they move forward with the auction based on the bidder pool that we have. So at least in without reserve auctions. So uh, we, we conduct two auctions, with reserve and without reserve. When there's a reserve, the bidding opens, and if the bidding meets or exceeds the reserve, then the property sells. Um, we work with published reserves, typically. It's rare that we'll do an unpublished reserve. So we will publish to the market, bidding has to meet this, this amount. If it's not a reserve, without reserve actually is our most popular and um, the the process that works it has the best sell-through rate for us. Um, so what we do in a without reserve auction is there's no predetermined price that we've arbitrarily set on the property to say that we have to meet or exceed or that the property's quote unquote worth this. Um, rather, we're marketing the property and we're seeing the interest that we get from bidders and we have bidders register with an opening bid. So when you step forward, Byron, and you want to bid on, you know, property in Maui, Hawaii, you know, you put down a deposit to bid on the property, typically $100,000 that you put into an escrow account. And we, our team vets you to have the, make sure you have the financial wherewithal to bid on the property. But then next from that, you register and you put in where you will open your bidding. And so, you know, you can choose, are you going to open it at a million dollars, two million, you know, five million. And then we're able to go to the seller and the agent ahead of the auction and show the lineup of bidders that we have and prove, you know, really through that lineup and, and discussion with them about all the activities that we've done and whatnot to generate um, those bidders, that market value is going to be 
identified at the auction, right? Bidding is going to go up from the opening bids. Those are committed bids as if they had been placed at the auction. So before the auction even opens, we basically have already had somewhat of a, a you know, little auction before the auction with bidders already placing their bids. And so they get to feel out where those bids could be coming even before that live auction. Yes, that's as, right. As a seller. Mm -hmm. So over $5 million, that's a small pool of homeowners, right? It, it's, it's not a lot of people uh, that own $5 million plus dollar homes. And I'm assuming that a lot of these uh, sellers can be quite demanding and eccentric. Uh, you, do you, and I know you probably can't use any names, but do you have any stories of situations where uh, clients really wanted to be fully engaged, almost wanting to drive uh, the ship themselves? Well, yes, certainly with clients in, in this realm, they are smart people. They've achieved and maintained their money because they have, you know, a great experience and actually a lot that we can learn from with every seller that we, that we work with. And with that does often come, you know, personalities. And, um, we, we say that someday maybe we'll write a book with anonymized <laughs> names yeah, of all, all the anonymous. stories that we have. Um, but we, we have a lot of them. I mean, we've, but today it's also interesting, you know, the, the shift in the clientele from, again, even pre-COVID three months ago and today. Um, we have one client, for example, that we were going to auction their property and they were able to renegotiate their mortgage payment. Many of the properties we sell don't have any mortgage, but this one, you know, did, did have a mortgage. And because of that, they got, they got a better mortgage payment. So they're just not going to sell their house for a period oh, wow. of time. You know, that, yeah. that was a seller of, you know, past few years, right? That we, we would have been able to perform for, but now that they can in this environment renegotiate, it's not the right fit for them. And instead there's a trend towards more sellers, again, that have a need, um, whether they have, we have one client who is a doctor, but he performs elective surgeries. And so he has not been able to have any income for the past two months. Um, and so he needs to, you know, liquidate the funds that he can out of one of his vacation homes. Um, we have other clients that are, you know, they know that they're not going to be spending um, time in their home in the next year. And so they want to sell it because of that. Um, so anyway, there's been a trip, but big personalities. Yes. Real big personalities. I saw one, and I don't know if it, it was in, in April, so I don't know if you've already sold it or not, but it was a Malibu house that one of the Kardashians used yes. or it was one of their properties or whatever the case may be there. Yeah. When there's a name tied to the property like Kardashian, do you see an increase in interest or sales price when you're able to market a celebrity name to a property? Definitely an increase in interest. And that one in Malibu, by the way, it's, it's up for auction at the end of this month, at the end of okay. May. Um, it's the home that Caitlin lived in during, I, I think it was a couple seasons ago, um, rented it on, she rented it on the beach. And so, yes, when we have properties like that, the press definitely has interest. And so by virtue of that, there's more exposure, then there's more, you know, website traffic and more calls about it. Ultimately, though, does not typically produce a higher price because the ultimate bidders who end up bidding on it, again, are smart people. They're not typically going to overpay just because there was a name associated with it. Um, one of the best examples I can think of is Michael Jordan's home, and we put it up for auction in 2013, and ultimately, we did not sell it. We didn't get a high enough um, bid for him at the time, but fast forward how many years later, seven years later, it's still on the market. Um, but with that one, I mean, yes, we had millions of views on all of the, the videos that we put together. Um, so, so much interest, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, again, a smart buyer that's going to buy it and, and it's difficult to find someone to just buy it just because it had someone's name. We've done business for no. Shaver and um, others like that, that yes, it, the media, 
is happy to talk about it. Yeah, there's definitely an added PR push. Now might be the time to get that MJ house back. I mean, documentaries going on, you get a little more. Uh, oh, there's been a lot of press about it lately. Yeah, yeah there has. you know, I of course get Google alerts whenever we're mentioned and we're often mentioned and they're still using our video assets and photo assets oh, wow. all over the place. What, yeah. are, what are the, the ones that you can disclose? What are your top three favorite celeb homes that you have sold? I know the Michael Jordan one you didn't, but what are the top three that you guys have completed a sale for that, you know, doesn't have to be the highest price, but that you just found uh, very interesting and, and were your favorite three? Celebrities specifically, Cher's home that we sold in Hualalai, which that was back in 2010. So we were only a couple years in, in business. And, and you love Hawaii. You're like, you're always. Uh, oh, I love Hawaii. My daughter's name is Kai, which means ocean in Hawaiian. Um, so, and during actually 2010 to 2013, I personally spent a ton of time in Hawaii because we were doing a lot of business there. We still are, but now we have, you know, salespeople who help out, um, who are based out of there. So this property is in Hualalai, which is the Four Seasons Resort in Kauai. I mean, I'm sorry, on the Big Island. Um, and so it's just a phenomenal resort. And Cher had custom built it and was very involved in the design of it and just was, was an amazing, amazing home. Um, I mean, I have a lot of homes that I think of when you say my favorites that aren't necessarily attached to celebrities, but we sold a, an architecturally significant home in Telluride, which at the time was the highest price for a residence in Telluride. I think it, it at least for a number of years, it maintained that it might still. Um, the name of the property was Pagomo, and it was a modern design home. Even most of the furniture was custom designed just for the house. And I love Telluride, Colorado, and I loved that house. So that would be one of my others. Very cool. All right. I, I'm just, I was just refreshing. I, like uh, I've said, we've, we've known each other for a while now, but uh, refreshing some stats on you guys. And I never knew this about you, but I read it somewhere that you have a nickname. Oh gosh, which one? I have a lot. <laughs> oh, you have a lot. Well, I only saw one, the doctor. Tell me about that. What's that all about? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. So yes, most people in our company have at least one nickname, if not multiple, because my partner, our chairman, Chad Roffers, he's like the king of nicknames. And so the doctor, I actually got only a couple months after I met Chad and I was probably like 24 years old. I'm a real estate agent in Florida and he, let me think of how, Oh, okay. So he said, he was the broker owner of the brokerage that I worked for and was teaching me the ropes. I had been in commercial real estate in Texas before moving to Florida. And so basically he said that I was earning my doctorate in real estate by working mm -hmm. under him. And so he told me I was supposed to go present at the MLS meeting the next day. And I'm young, I'm like a total rookie. And the MLS meetings at that time, early 2000s in Florida were hundreds of people. And I was nervous about it. And so he said, okay, you go up there and introduce yourself as Dr. Laura, and I'll give you a thousand bucks. And I was like, a thousand bucks, like that's, that's a lot of money, you know, I can totally do this. And so I got up at the MLS meeting and I introduced myself, you know, hi, I'm Dr. Laura. I just moved here from Texas, blah, blah, blah. And I just kept rolling with it. And anyway, I walked into the office and he gave me a thousand dollars. So you guys have like such great culture. Everybody I've met. Uh, that works with you has just been ecstatic about promoting the brand, being a part of it. You, you, I'm assuming you guys have really good retention. How many people you have and what's the culture like today? Yeah, we have a really, really great team. We have been really blessed by, you know, just continuing to grow with people that we enjoy working with and um, have really great camaraderie. Um, our team is uh, just under 100 people, somewhere between wow. maybe around 90. Um, and half of that is in some sort of sales capacity. So whether they're project sales managers, which as you mentioned, it's the role that goes into the market when we're selling a property, or business developers, which is the role that helps to um, curate and scope out seller 
sellers and new properties for us. Um, so that's about half of the business in different sales roles. And they are always remote. They're based out of various markets, wherever they live or wherever they're on assignment. And then the other half of our team is mostly in our Austin, Texas office, which is where I am in Austin. And we opened this office here about five years ago um, as we were growing our marketing and technology teams. And now we have finance and legal and some customer service roles based out of our Austin office. And, and, and how many in New York did you say? We now, we have some of our sales roles based out of New York, but we don't handle any of our operational elements out of New York anymore. We also have a small office in London with a few, few roles there. Mm -hmm. Are you rethinking the New York office space at all with what's happened or is, or just waiting to get back uh, and able to open back up there? Yeah. In, in New York, we have a few, again, most of our sales are people that are there in sales roles. So they don't typically work out of an office anyway. Um, we actually have two properties that we just launched that we're going to be selling in New York. So we have a couple more people that are going to help to sell those. So what's going to be in New York? Because right mm -hmm. now it's very difficult to even get into buildings because the doorman will stop you. Um, from, you know, so agents and brokers are not even sh doing showings right now. Right. What, what will the process, will it be fully virtual for, for that sale? Or will there be, you know, some way for these bidders to get into the property physically before mm -hmm. the auction? So that remains to be seen the, the, with both of these, the biddings at the very end of May. So right now we have a lot of virtual elements. You can go onto the website and you can see, you know, different photos and we will be launching different videos right now. There's a virtual viewing for each of them that the sales teams have created, you know, virtual walkthrough. Um, we also, for a number of properties, of course, are using Matterport and other immersive technologies, but it remains to be seen in the next few weeks, you know, how, what, how capable people will be of physically going into the property. Um, if not, we can bid them sight unseen or have someone go, you know, per, go view the property on their behalf and, and show them around with the video. Um, one of the properties is on Fifth Avenue and the other one's in Murray Hill. Would you, I, a lot of brokers think that this is true. Would you think, do you believe rather it's a good time to purchase New York City real estate? Well, I think that remains to be seen. I mean, certainly in, well, definitely it's a good time to purchase from sellers who, you know, are willing to sell to whatever market price is. And so that, that remains to be seen um, what market price is, which is what we're going to figure out with these properties. Um, I do think that, you know, New York will always have a, um, notoriety around the world and people know that. And so with that, I think we're going to um, continue to see interest there as well as other markets that, that have that same kind of cachet. You know, we sold a property in the Ritz Carlton in San Francisco just a few weeks ago, another one in the Hamptons, you know, as you mentioned, Malibu. So we're really focused on these markets that have always inherent um, value and New York city certainly has that. Do you see anything that's going to be significantly different in real? It doesn't have to be just with your company, but just across the real estate industry, significantly different from before COVID, after COVID. Mm -hmm. So definitely the way that everyone works and interacts. Um, being able to be more digital and remote right now, I think is eye opening to a lot of people as to how much can be accomplished like this. I actually had an interview with a New York publication, um, a couple weeks ago about handling closings remotely. And in New York, many closings are still handled at the closing table, you know, going to a title office or, you know, being, being with the closing agent. Um, for us, we've handled closings remotely for years because a lot of our clients are not local to the markets. Um, I think that that's something that it's going to be easier to change people not feeling like they physically have to be with someone to sign those documents. Um, and then definitely more, I think more reliance on real estate agents to maybe be, well, at least in, in this circumstance, as we start coming out of COVID, um, 
we're seeing buyers that are buying purely based on their agents inspections of the properties or views of the properties and relying on them and trusting them because their agent knows what they were looking for and showcasing that you actually can add value in that capacity and I mean, that's really like taking Absolutely. the faith and, and trusting your agent that they're going to give you the advice and educate you on being a buyer sight unseen right Mm-hmm. 100%. So as an agent, you have to build that trust and, and let your client know that you have their you know, best interests at heart, which you know, agents do. What piece of advice would you give to a real estate agent who has a seller that wants a luxury seller that wants increased activity, doesn't want to take this route? What's one thing an agent could do to increase awareness on a luxury sale? And not take it through and concierge. not take it through concierge, <laughs> right? So if they've got a seller's like, I'm not ready to do that. I don't want to do it. I'm going to have the conversation. Give, give me one piece of advice that you would share with, with agents uh, listening that um, they could utilize on their yeah. listings, mm-hmm. to, you know, outside of all the normal stuff, you know, professional photos and video and, you know, what's one thing they could do to get a broader reach? Yeah. Well, One thing I, it actually makes me first think of what not to do, which is the price reduction death by pinprick of little price reduction after, after, you know, one after the next, after the next. Okay. Um, So I think rather, especially in uncertain times like this, you know, holding firm on price and seeing what kind of activity you get from there. And then if you're going to do a reduction, make sure it's substantial enough to make a difference. Um, As far as, you know, going above and beyond for current listings right now. I think right now it's all about networking and especially networking with agents that are outside of your market. And especially at the ultra high end of the market, most of these clients own multiple properties and they're in feeder markets. So, you know, most of our clients that are selling in the Rocky Mountains, they have buyers that are Their their clients also own homes in Texas or in California. So figuring out how to have constant dialogue with other agents. And I mean, referral is always a big part of the real estate industry and trying to build those relationships. But I think now more than ever, the buyers that are interested in buying, they're going to be looking at multiple properties in different locations. So the more that you can align yourself with other agents that they're working with also um, and toss those referrals back and forth, the better. All right. Before we wrap this up, what is, uh, how, or how can an agent get on your radar and be, you know, a go-to for their service area, uh, to work with concierge? Great question. And that's very apropos and timely to a call. I'm about to hop on after you. Um, we are going to be hosting Wednesday sessions for education for real estate agents every Wednesday in the week in the month of May. So our new webinar that's called Block Talk, you can go to the website and it's blocktalknow.com. You can register for one of those age and education seminars and all of the attendees from those in May are gonna be immediately preferred agents certified with us. So you're going to receive information about how to talk about auction, not only with your clients, but also with other agents in your market and how to earn referrals, even if they're not your listings, from getting those other agents educated and bringing the listings to us, as well as having a presence on our website as a preferred agent. Um, So we're really excited about those. BlockTalkNow.com also has our schedule of other education sessions that we're doing. Um, Next up today, we're doing five myths of real estate auctions that we're going to debunk. So um, a couple of them have come up in my discussion with you here today um, as a little teaser. So anyway, we're taking on the, the webinar train for sure. I think that's smart. And I will definitely put that link. So if you're listening, check the show notes or on YouTube, go into the description, the link for that. Obviously, this is just for May right now, uh, these webinars are talking about May of 2020. So if you're seeing it in the next 30 days, there'll likely be an opportunity there for you to jump in. Laura, really appreciate you. I admire the journey you've been on and continue to go on. And uh, you've taught me a lot, honestly, about this industry. You've jumped on calls with me and walked me through scenarios. Uh, You introduced me to Brene Brown's books, which I've listened to. I haven't read a bunch of them, but I've listened to a bunch of them. Phenomenal stuff. 
And uh, you're absolutely one of, not a, I wouldn't even say up and coming, you're, you're one of the leaders in this industry and just appreciate your time and everything you're doing for the real estate world. Aw, thank you, Byron. I think so highly of you and have loved knowing you through the years. So love what you're doing. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Be well, stay healthy, and talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, Byron. You too. Hey, guys. Thank you so very much for watching the podcast all the way to the end. If you're enjoying this content, please subscribe to the channel. And better yet, do me a favor and leave a comment. Tell me what you think about this particular episode and who you'd like me to talk to next. And don't forget to watch some more podcasts. <laughs>